Well, first of all, thank you for uh, those who are here. Uh, thank you for those who have left. Thank you for those who invited me. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a little bit of a, uh, it's a many body problem, but these are the 87 electrons, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I hope I can show you that this has been uh, a really fun uh, uh, project over many, many years. So uh, let me start by uh, reminding you of the periodic table that is a little bit more than 150 years ago. And in the second uh, publication of the periodic table, Mendeleev, uh, 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 already in German, not in, in Russian, uh, I'll, you can see there are some missing things, right? So some missing things. He had uh, made the periodic table based on chemical properties, and we do see lithium, sodium, potassium, cesium, rubidium. Uh, but but then uh, there, there are there are lines, there are missing lines, and he gave a name to those missing lines, and the the name that he gave to those missing lines are always eka. So uh, the one that concerns us will be eka cesium. Okay, so this is the element that is in the same column but one down. So there were many uh, false starts. Uh, some of them happened in Russia, some of them happened in uh, Paris, some of them happened in the US, some of them happened in the UK. So that, that was changing around. But uh, the discovery of francium really didn't happen until this incredible woman appeared. And I am very happy to say that now in Palaiso you have a, a square in her name. And I have heard from Alain that there may be the name of the uh, Palaiso uh, station of the metro is going to be after her. So I want to point out to you that she was uh, uh, she was born in the east of Paris. She studied in the first lycée for uh, women in Paris, and she really had the dream to be a medical doctor. But the death of her parent made her look for an immediate uh, uh, job, and so she went to study chemist well, as a chemist. Uh, laboratory technician, and she was lucky to say uh, the Greece had made a deal with this school that they will hire the best student every year to be part of their team. And so at age 19, uh, uh, Marie called uh, Marguerite for an interview, and she hired her. Okay, so, uh, so this is uh, roughly in uh, 1920. That, uh, 1928, that she arrives a, at the institute, and how is she received? And I, I press to my graduate students, look, this is how I should receive you. Uh, so what happened is she was given 10 tons of a mineral, and they knew that there should be a little bit of actinium, and asked her, could you please purify it? It only took 10 years to purify it, and if you see the pictures, she's always smiling, she's always working hard. Uh, this implies doing grinding and then doing the chemistry. It's a, it, as a lantern. And on the magic day of uh, the 7th of January of 1939, she has a few uh, milligrams of actinium and discovers that there are two decays, two beta decays that she could uh, identify one at 220 kilo electron volts and the other one at 80 kilo electron volts and she measures the half life of the second and is 21 minutes all right but now look at what she does she then very very carefully says well what is the other one i know actinium decays but so uh, if you can read the, on the right column, it says that she adds, uh, I think it's uh, uh, cesium chloride. She adds cesium chloride because she knows that if adding, she adds cesium chloride, she will be able to substitute the cesium with the other alkali. Then she, you see on the left column, it says inactive, not active. And then 
there is the Eureka moment. I have just discovered element 87. And she has measured uh, the 21 minutes of lifetime. She was, uh, this is the reaction, the nuclear reaction that happened. And as being the discoverer, she proposes a name. And she proposes actinium X, which is immediately uh, objected by everybody. It is not until she finished her PhD that she settles and says, well, let's do francium. She tried other two names, by the way, OK? But, uh, but uh, it wasn't francium immediately. But uh, there she is, is the first uh, woman in the bottom left. Uh, and uh, this is roughly at the time that she discovered uh, the uh, actual uh, isotope that I'm talking about. So she, wa she won a fellowship for her PhD in a time which was a little bit tough to study in Paris, but she managed. This is 1939. There were some guests uh, uh, that arrived in September sorry, in 1940. And, uh, so that was a very hard time, but she did finish in 46. She became a professor of, in Strasbourg and was a head of nuclear chemistry. And she was the first woman elected as a corresponding member of the French Academy of Sciences in 1962. For those interested in this character, I strongly recommend you a beautiful article written by Veronique Greenwood in the New York Times Magazine, which is titled, My Great Great Aunt Discovered and, uh, Francium and it killed her. Indeed, she died as a consequence of the radiation. OK, uh, but uh, here we are. Uh, I want to introduce you to the atomic physics of French. So Sylvain Lieberman, who unfortunately died uh, on the younger side when he was having su uh, superb uh, success, was the person who was able to find the D2 line by using some extremely beautiful uh, optical pumping tricks that allow him to select, uh, when the, it hit the resonance, select the appropriately optically pumped uh, uh, with magnets. Uh, and they discovered that D2 line was 718. I have been told, although I wasn't there, uh, that in the, when he gave a talk uh, for I think there was an ICAP around uh, those years in Paris. He said that it was, sorry for changing to euro, but in those days the French had francs, but the size is about the right. Uh, he said that it was uh, like finding a euro in between Paris and Marseille. So the uncertainty that the theorists had given him to find the line was 20%. So it was 7, 18, plus or minus 20%. And this is a sharp line, uh, so that uh, required an incredible amount of very, very bright uh, uh, technology to, to find. So let me introduce you the uh, energy levels of francium. I, I, uh, I, uh, so the D2 line is 718. The D1 line is 817. The ground state hyperfine splitting of uh, isotope 210 is 46 gigahertz. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, one that is interesting for this talk is the 506 uh, line, OK? That, that uh, is going to uh, reappear uh, later in a few minutes. All right. So uh, I started in Stony Brook in uh, 91. And in association with uh, uh, Gene Sprouse, we thought, well, it should be fun to measure atomic parity non-conservation and compare the predictions of the standard model and study if the weak interaction behaves uh, roughly as uh, predicted in the presence of lots of new uh, nucleons. Uh, let's try to use a very heavy atom that we can understand quantitatively because the effects scale faster than C cubed. So let's give it a try. But really, really, it was because it was the fun of doing it, right? So, uh, 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 and that's what uh, has driven me over all these years, OK? Uh, there is uh, some excitement at each step. So the story in uh, Stony Brook is the first uh, four years, 
We spent trying to figure out how to make francium. It was a fusion reaction between gold and oxygen. It was a little bit embarrassing to tell the National Science Foundation that we are doing inverse alchemy. We took gold, uh, it went into francium, and eventually decayed into lead. So fortunately, they didn't uh, complain. But that's what we used, and we started trapping. That's our first trapped uh, signal, it was about 2,000 atoms. And we were able to, be, to, to make quite a few laser spectroscopy of francium. Look, this is like, uh, uh, this is a new toy, right? So nothing was measured, nothing was known, so we had the full feel for us. Eventually, we managed to increase the efficiency by having, uh, uh, understanding the target better. We measure lifetimes, and the last measurement we did uh, was the magnetic moment of uh, 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 one of the, but of to 10 front. Uh, I moved to Maryland, and then we moved the experiment to Triumph, which is the uh, nuclear and particle physics laboratory in Vancouver in Canada. And uh, what uh, have we done there? We built a uh, collaboration that has people from uh, the US, from Canada, from Mexico, from uh, uh, Australia. And thanks to all of you who pay taxes in any of those uh, uh, countries because you have supported us. OK, so uh, thank you, all right, really. Uh, so uh, what uh, we did, this was, uh, uh, it's a little bit different. We cannot uh, put a dispenser to uh, get our francium. So what we, the, we're connected to the accelerator on the left. The accelerator delivers francium ions of the isotope that we want at about 20 keV. We deposit the francium ions into a foil of yttrium or zirconium for 19 seconds. Then we flip the foil to the top, which closes that glass cube where we form the, uh, uh, the moth, the magneto-optical trap. We run a current to heat the foil to about 1,000 Kelvin. And you may say, why do we use yttrium or zirconium? And it's because those guys deliver then as output neutral brand. We trap it, and once we trap it and cool it, we transport it down to another uh, environment, which is much more controlled. Uh, and in that uh, second environment, we can apply electric fields. You see electric fields, those plates that you see there. Uh, uh, will apply a uh, DC electric field perpendicular to uh, the uh, surface of the screen. Uh, we have a power buildup cavity because we're going to try to excite the 506, uh, the 506 uh, uh, light, and then uh, we can apply magnetic fields in the other perpendicular direction. As all of you know, if you want to see or study parity, you have to, it's like, uh, okay, what do you need to know which one is your left hand and which one is your right hand? Well, you better get some globes that have fingers so that you can put the correct side on the correct uh, uh, hand. So uh, the coordinate system in our case is defined by those uh, three objects, the electric field DC, the magnetic field DC, and the <coughs> direction uh, the, of the polarization, right, in terms of uh, sigma plus and sigma minus. So basically, we are going to follow the techniques that uh, well, were, were so successful in the uh, uh, experiment of Carl Wyman about 20, uh, 25 years ago. But uh, uh, Phil, I honestly don't remember if this interference is what you use for your experiment with Gene. But anyway, so uh, the uh, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, the excitation between two S states, the dipole excitation is forbidden, and you go up, and uh, uh, then you come back down, and then you can detect at page 17. You see there is it's a very clean thing. Uh, and uh, what we're going to do is uh, 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 measure the rate of excitation uh, with a system which is right-handed, and then measure it with a system which is left-handed. Uh, uh, and that uh, the difference between those rates is going to be uh, 
basically something that our friends uh, in uh, atomic physics can calculate and can compare to predictions of the standard model. Right, so, but uh, we're not yet there. Uh, yes, I am emeritus professor, but I still want to have fun in the lab. Uh, but I'm going to show you the last measurement that we did. And the last measurement that we did is an M1 transition between the 7S and the 8S. So uh, you would all say, oh, come on, uh, uh, those are forbidden because it's a different uh, uh, principal quantum number. Well, uh, but there is some hyperfine mixing, and of course, there is relativity. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to go from uh, one of the uh, hyperfine states to one of the excited states uh, in our system. And you see, in general, you will have to start uh, the M1 and the parity non-conserving amplitudes. And by selecting appropriately the uh, uh, apparatus, uh, one can suppress the parity and just concentrate on the M1. And that's what we're going to do. So we suppress the PNC, uh, and now we're going to interfere these two things. And we're going to use the Stark, uh, which happens to have the vector polarizability, uh, and uh, we're going to m try to measure what is the, uh, as a function of electric field, we're going to reduce the electric field, what is the value of that M1 transition, okay? So the M1 has two contributions, as I said, one is hyperfine mixing and the other is relativity. So this is the signal, so the uh, oscillator strength is about 13 orders of magnitude smaller than uh, the uh, uh, D2 line, uh, and I think uh, the students have learned a very good lesson that I told them, your whole uh, PhD depends on signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, and so we, uh, we this, I, I think it's, it's a decent signal-to-noise ratio. We were able to look at the uh, signal as a function of DC electric field, and we see the quadratic thing, and it's that it's small difference at the, uh, when the voltage is zero, what we're looking for. And that's the signal that I just showed. But uh, the students understood the lesson that we have to improve the signal to noise. And so what we decided is to recycle the atoms that decay into the F prime so that we could get lots of photons out for every excitation that went. So uh, with that, lesson, we were able to get now signal-to-noise ratios of this value, which are closer to a factor of a, a thousand. So this gives me an enormous confidence that we are indeed uh, uh, approaching the moment when we can see and say something coherent about parity uh, violation, right? This, there is one last thing that we need to control, and it's not trivial, and it, we need to know exactly uh, the M state and how all the other M states are popping. Okay, so we need to do a, uh, a, a very careful job about optical pumping, but also about measuring how well we uh, optically pump. So at the end, we measured a number. Our number is 130 plus or minus 10. Uh, the number, this is just the relativistic part. Remember, we use, uh, what we actually measure is M1 over beta, and we use Mariana Safranova's number, we use Mariana Safranova's number to extract then the M1. Uh, we calculate the hyperfine value, and what is really impressive, and I, it's a testimony for the enormous high quality of her many body wave functions, uh, this is an ab initio calculation, and when I say ab initio, it is before the, we knew the number. <laughs> so she did it starting with everything. Okay, so I am very, very happy to show you this result, but uh, you will hear uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, our next speaker, my very dear friend Dave, made a phone call and convinced me that there was an even more interesting thing to try with francium, 
and that he, he will tell us uh, a lot more about it. And so now, uh, thanks to uh, the uh, big push of Dave and, uh, that, uh, and other people, uh, we are now going to try to do something very simple. We're going to try to do uh, francium silver molecules. Uh, and Dave uh, assures me that this is going to give us four orders of magnitude in sensitivity in an EDM measurement. Look, I've been known to try things that are crazy, so joining Dave is so reassuring, right, that uh, I am delighted that that's happening. The initial uh, group of people that uh, decided to uh, go for it is here, right? Uh, we have people from uh, Davis, the, the lead. We have people from Triumph. I, I am still a hanging up, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, a few other people. And uh, with that, I look, this is indeed many body physics of a very different kind of what we have uh, uh, talked here. I've enjoyed what I have heard, and I hope uh, you realize that there are other ways to uh, arrive at ETA. Thank you very much.